Hello, everyone. Um, welcome, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Özge Arsoy. Um, I'm the Public Programs Lead at Asia Arts Archive here in Hong Kong, and I'll be the moderator of today's discussion. Um, this talk is organized by Orta Format. Uh, we have Ipek, uh, one of the, the members of Orta Format, with us right now. Um, and Orta Format is an independent publishing initiative based out of Istanbul. Uh, with a focus on photography. Uh, I've been following their work uh, for about 10 years now, and I really want to thank them for inviting me to be part of this discussion. Um, this talk is also part of their online uh, talk series, uh, Orta Format's online talk series called Niet. And Niet, uh, it's a word in Arabic that's also used in Turkish, um, and it means intention. So, so far this series um, has hosted speakers from a wide range of disciplines like philosophy, um, political science, and psychology. Um, and the idea has been to explore the various interpretations of this notion. So intention with all the related associations like determination, anticipation, and projection for the future. Um, today, we are very excited to welcome two speakers, uh, Heba Hedgefelder and Vartan Avakyan. Um, Hevo is the, the director of the Arab Image Foundation, and Vartan is an artist and a board member of the same organization. I'll try to give a very brief summary um, about Arab Image Foundation uh, before we start the conversation so that um, Heba and Vartan, they don't repeat the, the obvious ones. Um, this is an independent association founded in Beirut in 1997, and it focuses on research, collecting, archiving, and artistic production around photographic practices. Um, they have a collection that comprises uh, 500,000 photographic objects and documents from and related to the Middle East, uh, North Africa, and the, the Arab diaspora. And today we'll talk about how the Arab Image Foundation team thinks about the ideas, um, the forms, and the methods of preservation, custodianship, and care um, some of the ideas that they've been thinking about for over two decades now. Um, I also have to add that I've been an admirer of their work for a long time, and I very much look forward to learning more about what they are thinking, what they're discussing and developing these days. Um, and just before we start, just a note for housekeeping. Um, we'll have this conversation for about 45 minutes. And then we'll open the floor for your questions and comments. Um, we'll have plenty of time for discussion. And um, it's great that it's not a webinar, it's a meeting. So please feel free to um, just unmute yourselves and just um, share your ideas with us. So without further ado, um, Heba and Vartan, thank you so, so much uh, once again for joining us. Uh, I also see some more people joining. So I want to start with a question. Um, about preservation in the context of the, the Arab Image Foundation. Um, how your understanding of preservation has changed over the last two decades. And I know it's a, it's a big question, so I'll try to unpack it very, very quickly. Because we, we know that one of the, the earliest um, intentions of the Arab Image Foundation was to collect and conserve photographs from the region. So the artists and the members, they became the, the guardians of these physical materials. And of course, more recently, um, scanning technologies, digitizing technologies, they changed drastically. And we know that two years ago, you launched this online platform uh, with the, the digitized uh, version of some of your collections. Um, and also, I have in my mind, there is also growing critical discourse about the, the power positions that collections create you know, across the, the different countries um, here in Hong Kong as well. So can you walk us through this journey, um, how you started discussing preservation and what are some of the, the difficult decisions that you had to make over time? Um, and Heba, perhaps we can start with you. Sure, thank you very much, Uzge. And thank you, Ipek, also, and Orta Format team for launching this conversation. Um, Vartan and I are delighted to be a part of it and uh, we're looking also forward to the questions from the participants in the Zoom meeting. What I'll try to do is in explaining a bit how the Arab Image Foundation looks at the notion of preservation, I'll also take the opportunity to walk us through 
its, its evolution. So talking about its history, some of the milestones that have shaped how we, we talk about uh, preservation today and how we apply that. What I'll do is I'll share the screen so that you can also look at some images with me. Okay, it works? Yeah. You can see the moving? Good, okay. So just to, um, to summarize, basically, in the last 24 years, the AIF has been in the business of, of preserving photographic objects. And basically what we're talking about is the notion of preserving the physical, the materiality of the object. We're also talking about the digital preservation in terms of surrogates, copies, but also providing access so that the object can live on outside of its physical existence and be something that people can look at, can study and can add information and, and uh, stories about. And so this type of resonance that crosses borders is also a way of preserving photographic objects. But I think the most important part of why we preserve and, and why this intention to preserve is exactly to, to push against the shrinking civic space around us as an independent uh, association where in a region, uh, if, if not in, in this particular country, there's very little public support to conserving, to preserving heritage, to making it available to the public. And so from the early days, there's been this motivation to expose a lot of this heritage so that we can come up with alternative narratives and not stick to something that's monolithic and that's a, a dominant story in, in society. And I'm sure this is the case in many places around the world, but in particular in this region, it's, it's, um, it's a big need. And, um, and there's, there's this urge to disseminate, whether it's through publications, through exhibitions, through talks, and precisely to be able to come up with different narrations on one particular image. Uh, and because events are events, but depending on the perspectives people have, they would come up with a different story. And so it's the physical, digital, and as I said, this urge to push open civic spaces so that we can come up with uh, multiple narratives. In 1997, when the association was being formed, it was very much influenced by artists and practitioners who had this intention to collect at first. And so just to remind you the context at the time, this was 15 years after the civil war. And this was the time when there was post-war reconstruction going on. Um, there was a huge gap in terms of heritage preservation let alone a country that was, you know, had fallen apart and was trying to be rebuilt. And so the founders had this urge to salvage whatever it is that they were finding and researching. And with no public support and no structure to host the collections that they were having, um, they created this association so that they could mix the artistic creation with research, with archiving, and with this willingness and volonté, as they say, to, to, to explore and to question politics, religion, and issues that are, are of concern to us today. Uh, and not so much just to have images that we can be nostalgic about, but to provoke and to question our modern day reality. So the, for the first seven years since 90, so 97 up to 2005, the founders and the members at the time were very much in the researching and the connecting and the studying of photographic uh, objects. They traveled to places um, within Lebanon, but also Syria, Palestine, Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, Iraq, Iran, and also in diaspora communities from the region. So places like Mexico and Argentina, and later on to Senegal. And what is interesting is that this was the height of the research missions and acquisition, if you wish. So this was the phase in, in the institution where it was amassing collections. And this has slowed down with time. 
um, and, and it's, it's only natural. Today we have in our custody over 300 collections amounting to more than 500,000 uh, objects and some date as far back as 1860. And we're always thrilled when we discover new ones. It's just that with the sheer amount of labor that goes into preserving and into caring for collections, it's only natural that this has slowed down over time. And the collections, for those who don't know, they come from different sources. Some are for our family photographs, some come from photo studios, professional photographers, but also vernacular photography. So it's a very wide range. And caring has always been at the heart of, uh, of our work. Uh, so when we talk about preservation, it's really the constant question of how do we take care of what's in our, in our custody? And the practice has evolved with time in the sense that we've always uh, put ourselves in a situation where we need to rethink our approach. Sometimes these are internal discussions, depending on the vantage point of the members or those involved in the association. And other times it's provoked in response to factors that are outside of, of the organization. And it's in retrospect that we can look back and say, you know, what have been the changes the first factor is, as I said, the absence of public support, the fact that this is a, a non-profit, small institution with, with limited capacity. The intention was never to set up a museum or a, a closed archive. The idea was always to be a bridge between archival practices, maintaining some kind of standards and notion of how to preserve, but also being a bridge to contemporary artistic practices. And it's the diversity of perspectives that often invite practitioners to question with us and propose new directions in how we do this type of care and how do we look at collections. This image is just to show you one of the collaborations, for instance, with a, with a, with a journal that does comics and tells a lot about uh, uh, real event stories and issues that concern us today through comic uh, and through comic strips. And they worked with us looking at the collection, exposing it and coming up with different interpretations of what these images tell. Samandal is, uh, this was uh, issue number 14. I invite you if, you, if you have the time to look through it and see how people look at our collection in different, with different disciplines, but also with different perspectives. The question of what to preserve, uh, this is, is, is timeless. Every time we get a collection in our hands, we always say, you know, what do we do with this? What has been constant or rather something that we've come to adopt is that we don't see photographs as mere images. They're unique with, with their physical attributes depending on how they arrive at, at the foundation. And there's so many layers to what one can unpack. And it's not just a two dimensional object. And so what's written on the back is as relevant as the image itself. And the challenge is always, how much can we preserve of the physical material and what should we preserve? Um, what we try to do at AIF is keep the narrative and the context around the collection as intact as possible. And these images that you see here are from um, Photo Jacques, which was a studio in northern Lebanon in Tripoli. And the photographer had a very particular way of putting together and archiving and cataloging his pictures. As you can see, the negatives are inside paper sleeves. And they, you, you can see nails and you can see ropes. Um, and so maybe another institution would say, oh, let's take out the negatives and make sure we prolong their life as, as much as we can. And in our case, it was no. We said we want to maintain the story. We want to, we want to keep this craft alive and try to document it as well as take care of the negatives. So we didn't take them out and we looked at ways of conserving it in such a way that we could respect the entirety of the, of the object. Um, for instance, we don't intervene, we don't manipulate. If we have an image, as you can see, that is eroding, 
uh, due to chemical processes or if it arrives to us like that, we try to preserve by just cleaning, making sure that it's properly housed, but we don't intervene in correcting that image. And because that's the story and that's the life of it. Um, so here you see another uh, way in which we also document what is positive, what is negative, in order to expose all these layers. Or if an image arrives to us in a different format, if it's in an album, if it's if it's in a negative, uh, in a film, um, if it's in a glass plate, we try to maintain the, um, yeah, how, how it's housed. Another factor that really plays a role in, in the evolution of how we've come to preserve and, and the notion of preservation is technology. Precisely the digital realm, which is not necessarily new to AIF. We've, the, the association has always been documenting and trying to keep digital surrogates. But the surge in access came in 2016 when the foundation made a conscious decision to really push forward the digitizing process and make sure that as much as possible can be accessed online for people to enjoy, to study and to look at these, uh, these collections. So this digital milestone is only five years old, but in a way it has opened up um, what we call preservation through access and, and by providing access to a wide number of, of people and still capturing the three-dimensional layers of the object in the same way that we do when we preserve our collections physically. This is basically the page on, uh, on our online platform. I said beta version because it's still something we're working on. We're not very happy with everything that's on there and we're really trying our best to make sure that it's as interactive as possible and that it has all these layers that would stimulate researchers and artists to look um, and explore the photographic objects. We have around 28,000 online, so that's a very tiny bit in comparison to the amount of uh, images that we have in the foundation. This is, for instance, a family album uh, that we try to capture not only as a single photograph, but as a as an entire object. Um, and then the evolution, again, is always influenced by, by new perspectives and how people challenge us in how we archive and by the research lines of inquiry into the practice, into the craft. Do we preserve to prolong the life of images? Do we want to do absolutely everything to make sure that they don't deteriorate? Or uh, are we more engaged and putting effort into questioning what is our role as custodians when we're preserving? And how do we provide greater access while respecting rights of owners? Um, how, do we, how are we the platform and the link between those two rightful objectives? Um, and also, how do we make sure that through our, our programming, whatever it is that we're preserving, is used and is the object of inquiry, be it through talks or research articles or people who just want to create artistic objects out of our collections. And the latest, for instance, collaboration that we've had, some of you may have seen it, was with uh, Usha Madian, reflecting, for instance, on the Nigol Bezjian collection, which is a rich collection of over 90 uh, images. And we had some very basic documentation about it. They took this and then they researched the, the photographs precisely to reflect on the Armenian community at the time. This was after the genocide and their, their way of life, their resilience, how they had to flee and move to different parts of, of the region and um, resettle and refind uh, or find a new life. And so by default, this type of research and these types of additional stories is a way of prolonging um, the life of these images and preserving the memory through these stories. I think I'll stop here. I just wanted to mention one last bit, 
which has to do with the latest disaster uh, in Beirut. And I put this very um, disturbing image because these are the events that always remind us of the fragility of what we have in our custody. And so the whole notion of preservation takes on another dimension. It's no longer about how do I safely keep a collection in a place? Where should I relocate to, to make sure that such disaster doesn't um, affect it? But it's also the questions of what kind of multiple lives can we give to any collection, whether it's physical or digital, or again, this notion of access and allowing people to carry these collections in their stories, in their articles, in their films. Um, and this has been a, a very telling moment for us at, at the foundation. Um, and just for those who, who have been following the news, we didn't have any damages per se, but the risk is huge and another disaster may cause extreme damage. Um, the foundation has asked itself, in the name of preservation, should we be moving the collection out of Beirut? And then the other notion kicks in and says, but, and Vartan would speak to this because I've heard him say it, this, these collections come from this region and the events of the region historically and politically is also what shapes it. And so it's a huge responsibility to say, I'm going to move the collection outside of this context just to protect it. When another argument would say, we need to keep it here because this is where it metamorphoses into something else and takes on the scars of the events around it and provokes new notions of how can we share and care for a collection not by hoarding, but by exposing it to different outlets where it can grow and, and multiply. That's it. <laughs> so I think I, I can pick it up here. Uh, since the initial question is about intention, niye, it is true that uh, when the first collection processes started, the intention was preservation of these documents, historic documents, at a time in the 90s where we had already understood that, that negatives from the turn of the 19th to 20th century were, were technologically endangered, like, like physically they needed the preservation. And while that happened in the context of, of taking charge of these narratives, these objects, these artifacts of, of heritage and culture to, uh, to engage with them and generate new content and new archives from them. We, we find ourselves now with collections that are endangered in different ways uh, if, from technological and historic perspectives. For example, technologically, a Polaroid from the 80s has a shorter lifespan than a negative from the 30s. So it is even as a medium endangered. Mm -hmm. Or a collection that exists only on a digital platform, on a hard disk. Hard disks have much shorter life, lifespans than, than other mass storage devices. But other than the technological dangers, there is there are other dangers that are political, especially now in a context of a world that is increasingly ch challenged by wars, ongoing conditions of coloniality, final, finalization, uh, and environmental destruction, like all of which bring out new forms of migration, displacement, dispossession, and transition. So we continue to investigate ways in which our archive can function as a space for renegoti renegotiating the distribution of agency, uh, imagine forms of custodianship, and address questions around rights. This is, this is particularly important now in a pandemic and an economic recession, where we see the geopolitical tectonic shifts around us uh, become very drastic and violent. 
we see how these shifts uh, are influencing the Maghreb from Libya to the Western Sahara, the Caucasus from, from Circassia to Artsakh, Arafah to the Caspian Sea, and of course in the Middle East from now, uh, again, Palestine and Kurdistan. With these conflicts, we found ourselves as custodians of, of cultural artifacts in a position of responsibility towards certain collections that are endangered now. Uh, good examples can be now, especially since our region is dominated by authoritarian regimes that push for a univocal discourse about rights, about history, creating a place for, for a multiple narrative conversation is a way to move forward with collections that can be endangered. For instance, Armenian collections from the Ottoman Empire, Kurdish collections within our region, and also uh, the LGBT community related collections. And I'm specifying this because these are collections we are working on now, knowing that even a collection that is well preserved on a material level, its context is very important for its ongoing preservation as a witness of history. At the Arab Image Foundation, our preservation efforts are related to the medium, but also to the context of, of the photograph. The, the multiple layers of inscription include what the photograph represents, annotations that are added on it willfully, the traces that are left on it accidentally through its movement, but also the historic context of a photograph. Where was this taken and how and why it moved? With, with dangers uh, uh, around collections, even, even recent collections whose stories are preferred not to be heard, uh, there is a danger on a collection we are working on that documents the story of the trans community in Lebanon in the 80s and 90s, although it's quite recent. Th there is a danger that the collection ends up in a museum or a collection where it's acquired only to be buried, like, like catch and kill stories in the media. So a museum might show first interest only to get the collection and never do activities or programming around it. Or in, in politically charged collections like the Kurdish and Armenian collections, uh, certain museums, if they are national museums dominated by non-democratic regimes, they might bury them or we already see a lot of efforts around us for cultural erasure, historic revisionism and similar activities. So this is why we believe while an image in its, a photograph in its, in, in its most primordial uh, form is a documentary representation of the likeness of things or, or a proof of the existence of events, it is at the same time uh, a cultural artifact like a manuscript like, uh, like an LP with music on it. It is a cultural artifact that not only requires a preservation to be put in a museum, but activation through conversations, through additional documentation that creates alternative documents that talk about this original artifact as a means of preservation. So if uh, we engage with one photograph to produce a text on it, the text becomes a new document. If we produce a film about it, if we do this talk about it and this is recorded, these become archives of their own that help in the, in the preservation of the context of the artifact and sometimes even if the artifact is lost or destroyed. So I think I'll stop here and leave certain examples for, for the common questions. Yeah, Barton, it would be great um, if you can um, share 
with us a couple of examples because when it comes to, to modes um, and methods of preservation and custodianship, um, there are the um, front ends and the back ends, right? Uh, we are speaking in the front, we are speaking about um, the displays, the, the, the storytelling, the exhibitions, how we give access, uh, what type of uh, narratives or stories we are creating around those documents. And in the, in the back end, of course, there are the, the questions around how do we classify, how do we organize, how do we create the tree structures, um, or how do we push for, some, for certain collecting policies within the organization as well. So if you could give um, one of the, the, the current examples, one of the projects that you are working these days, and some of the the difficult discussions that you are having with the, the team as well, that would be great. Maybe some moments where you're also hitting the wall and then you are still uh, conversing among yourselves about um, how to get out of this, let's say, maybe there's a set of dilemmas, etc. So it would be amazing if you could share some examples with us. Okay. Mm, I, uh, I'll say there are two efforts now at the same time happening. One within the foundation through their uh, policies of preservation and documentation and at the same time since the Arab Image Foundation is an association of members who engage with the collection as well currently for example three of the board members Yasmin Eid Sabah, Christine Khoury and me we are holding a workshop it's a course at, at the Kevorkian Center at NYU to look at three collections that are related to migration, the Senegalese collection, collections from Latin America, from the, from the, from the diaspora, and Armenian collections. And I, I will talk about this aspect and let Hiba talk about what the team is doing. One of the things we, for example, realized that while, while the Arab Image Foundation holds a disproportionate number of Armenian photographers within its collection, from, from Cairo to, uh, uh, to Beirut, to Aleppo, to the Middle East, to uh, uh, Tehran, particularly Armenians who moved uh, within the Ottoman Empire before, during, and right after the ethnic cleansing campaigns, which were the Armenian genocide, their, this aspect of their story was never in the bio, which, which is particularly jarring. So uh, we are engaging now within a workshop on ways we can make sure that the context of the photographs are inherently uh, associated with a particular photograph. I can, for example, show you some photos. Let me share my screen from one collection, the Vakalian collection. Meanwhile, I can probably tell you about one, uh, one photographer, Van Leo, who uh, the Arab Image Foundation is, is happy to say is publishing a huge book finally after 10 years of research, like three volume book on his work. He was a Cairo based Armenian photographer and being uh, the son of a displaced genocide survivor was an important aspect of his identity moving to Cairo and, and living there. And we finally can tell more about that context other than just looking at his craftsmanship as a very creative portrait maker. So it moves away from a mere nostalgic look at old practices into why certain practices look a certain way. So let me share my, my screen and show you three photographs that we are working on now with a group of researchers to think about how we can uh, view, I think you see, right? Yes, it's working, thanks. So this is a rather normal photograph of a representation of a family. It's from 1905 in Mersin. 
The young man is Sarkis Bakalyan. This is Sarkis Bakalyan getting married 15 years later. This is from the same collection, a funeral procession from 1898 in Adana, where he is from. And this particular photograph, for example, if it's not given the context it needs, it can be used just as if someone is doing research on Ottoman rituals from the late 19th century or, or the costumes within the Ottoman Empire. However, it has a very particular context. And that context, we need to imagine how it needs to incorporate it with it. And I will end with this photograph, Franz Sarkis Bakalyan on his death, deathbed in Lebanon in the 30s. So in his particular case, and this family's history that is very particular, these stories need to be associated and not dissociated from the photograph. I can give you uh, a certain a context of the first photograph written by Ani Bakalyan, the descendants of, of the family, who is an associate director of Middle East and Middle Eastern American, sorry, she is the associate director of the Middle East and Middle Eastern American Center. It's a weird name. And the master's program in Middle Eastern studies at the Graduate Center at CUNY. She's the historian of the family and she has provided context. I won't read it all, but basically, this last photograph is of Sarkis Bakalyan in 1937 in Khanda al -Ghani. It's important to know that he lived in Khanda al -Ghani because I think it's an area now we don't associate with our new community. He was born in Kayseri in 1877. And she tells us the story of why this family was able to escape and take its collection with it. And this is a very important aspect of our Armenian collections, which are, which are always missing parts because very few people were able to take their belongings, let alone their archive with them. And this becomes not only the story of the Bakalyan family, but other moving Armenian families after the genocide. So this opens the discussion of why there are gaps in certain collections at certain times. And, and the kind of questions we're trying to raise now with the family, with other members of this group that we are thinking on renegotiating the contracts that define how this collection should be used to make sure it's preserved against historic revision, revisionism. Uh, also, maybe incorporating certain elements that are very intrinsic to this collection within the required caption so that it's never used just as an image of a dead man but to give agency back to the depositors of the collection so this is the activity we are doing now which is basically uh, reverting clearly to our role as custodians where we go to our depositors and empower them again against new dangers thinking especially for example after the economic uh, you know meltdown in lebanon and and security issues for example the beirut explosion we need to think of what will happen to this collection if the arab image foundation eventually has to work with another institution for their preservation so maybe we need to go back to our depositors and think with them, how can they add uh, certain clauses to their contracts to make sure that their story is told the way they want to tell it. Barton, I want to pick up on uh, the, the idea of the, the missing information that you talked about, because as you said, sometimes when we um, encounter these images, we immediately think about some sort of indexical information, right? Who's the photographers? Who's the subject? Uh, what is the place? What's the date? And even if some of these, um, let's say, uh, pieces of information are set or are visible, there's always missing information in the background. But um, at the same time, 
even if there is the um, idea of completing these um, missing information, missing, missing pieces in the jigsaw puzzle, uh, working with the, the people who um, deposited these photographs with the Arab Image Foundation, there will be always missing gaps. So I'm also wondering if you can speak about the, the role of speculation when it comes to, to storytelling using these images. Is that something that uh, you would like to, to keep working on? Is that um, a direction that you're also um, discussing or negotiating with some of these families and depositors? Yeah, this is always a, a thorny subject because like in art imagination is a key point and we need to fill in some of these narratives by imagination or or creating conditions that might happen uh, so it, it is a thorny subject because i stand on both sides like as an artist i want this creative freedom but i took the responsibility of being uh, a board member of the uh, of the Arab Image Foundation. So now I'm responsible as well to make sure that if I'm using a certain photograph or a certain collection or certain gaps and absences to speculate are within, are renegotiated with the depositors. Because if we don't have this safeguard, they can be co-opted within, for example, the discourse of a fascist party, like fascist party comes to Lebanon, they want to prove something, they dig up some photographs. So there needs to be safeguards. We need, as, as people responsible, custodians for the collections, we need to make sure that our depositors know of the dangers and willfully give access in the ways they are comfortable with. We don't want to tell them what they need to do, but we need to, if you know something, we need to share it with them. If we see, for example, that a part of the Arab Image Foundation's collection is going to an institution that is an Armenian genocide denier, we need to go only to the Armenian collection and tell them, look, this is their position, what do you want to do? It's upon them to decide. And I'm focusing uh, uh, on this because this is the aspect that I'm working on now. While the two other collections, we have two collections coming, two Kurdish collections and one collection from the trans community in Lebanon, which we are still processing to see how we want to include them within our archive. And we can't, I think, show them yet because we might decide again as custodians to convince them to keep the collections where they are and help them and help their preservation where they are because it's safer where they are. So the tactics are different, but about filling the gap, there needs to be this balance between knowing, yeah, keeping the agency not not unilateral, having it shared and part of a, of a conversation that takes into account uh, yeah, the needs and dangers facing each and every single collection. This actually takes me to, to the next question that I wanted to, to ask uh, for both of you. Um, and the question is about the, the idea of openness, because when we think about the, the arts organizations, most of the time, we, um, we think about them as these spaces of public discussion, public display, exhibitions. Um, so we often think about the, the visible components of the, or the public outputs of these organizations. And I wanted to ask you, maybe uh, we can go back to, to the example that you gave, Artan. Um, I want to ask you if, if you've ever had to, to negotiate that sense of openness or publicness in exchange of your capacity of care. Um, exactly what you were saying a couple of minutes a couple of minutes ago, or to put it in other words, I'm wondering um, if you can share more about the, the discussions within the team about certain materials that would benefit from an environment that's not immediately exposed or easily exposed to the public. 
Okay, so maybe I give some historic context about this discussion about openness and then, and then leave it to Hiba to give examples from certain projects. Uh, this discussion started 10 years ago at the Arab Image Foundation, where I wasn't a member yet. I think, so I don't know the entire history, but I know that Yasmin Itzabach, the current chair of the, of, of the board, was very vehemently pushing for a more open access uh, archive, but I'm sure others as well. And it was a political decision taken based on the fact that we are an association that is trying to build what I like to call a community of witnesses. And the wider this community is, the more preservation we can get. Because every document is only data if there is no witness to decode it. So building a community of witnesses can be based on, on multiple tactics, inviting people to engage as witnesses to create new documents. A good example can be uh, the artist Jumana Manna came to the Arab Image Foundation, took one photograph of a masquerade happening in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, I think in the 20s, and then recreated that moment in a film. So it created another archive another document that can be archived. So, so she was a witness. And now everyone who has seen the film is a witness of the original photograph and its context, even if the photograph disappears. So building a community of witnesses can happen that way, but it can also happen by opening up for more people to engage in ways we can't even imagine. Not only researchers, artists, historians, anthropologists. And it was a very difficult endeavor because each collection out of the 300 to 350 collections is governed by its own contract. So we took a, a principled position saying we are for openness. Any collection that the depositors gave the rights for the Arab Image Foundation will go online and we will encourage through dialogue most people to open their archives for open access with conditions. They can decide that this particular photograph, I don't want it used, or this particular photograph, like we're doing now, say with the Bakalian collection, they may say everything is open access. However, these two photographs, if someone wants to use them, they have to have this caption that tells the history of our family. Otherwise they can choose another photograph. So we created the, the environment to create this community of witnesses and encourage by practice uh, more depositors to work with us towards this more open access. And I think Hiba can give other examples of special projects. Maybe a SMEs project is a good start. Um, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll speak about this one example. Uh, Vartan mentioned Yasmin's research work for many years with the Burj Shmaili community. Um, it's a community of refugees, one of the refugee communities in Lebanon that dates back to 1948. Um, for those who don't know, I mean, these are people who have been refugees all over the region when the state of Israel was, was created. And in, in wanting to be participative to the extreme sense, the, the amount of research and the amount of material that she collected was never made public and it was intentionally kept in, uh, um, kept a bit, you know, uh, outside, out, outside of this public realm precisely to give the owners and the, the, the meaning the, the owners of those stories of this collection the possibility to negotiate and say when they want to activate it and in what way. So this is one example of an entire project that focused on this notion precisely to elevate the discussion to more than just, ah, can we show this picture and not the other one, but really to talk about who owns the, the authority and the power to engage on images. We're talking about images of 
people, there are people's faces, there are people's uh, stories that, that evoke also emotions by those who, who know them. And so this responsibility to always question, even if we have the legal right to a collection, we still have the moral and the ethical obligation to ask ourselves, what is it that we're projecting? And who do we need to ask when we're putting something out there? The interesting dialogue that happens within the organization is on two levels. On the one hand, it's exactly this back and forth looking at certain contractual agreements, depositors' wishes, being respectful of this kind of entente, but also when we get image requests from people who want access to a collection and having this discussion, and it's always a case by case, uh, trying to see, okay, what is the objective? Why is this being used? What is it needed for? Because at the core of our mission, is education, raising awareness, and making sure that the amount of access that we provide goes to exactly this type of research that delves more into collections and generates new narratives. We're less interested in uh, requests that cater for commercial purposes, and we question a lot more when some things are dodgy. So this, there's this whole internal procedure that kicks in, and my colleague, who's here, uh -huh. she, she can tell you uh, <laughs> in many words about that. The other interesting dimension is our place as a nonprofit vis-a-vis -vis donors. In a lot of cases, and I don't know if many of you have experience with this, but in many cases, this call for open access, as if it's a good in itself, becomes a way of uh, imposing a certain authority on a project. So I, I give you my money if you make sure that everything you're preserving and digitizing ends up on the internet. And it can't be black and white. We have the responsibility to also negotiate and push back and tell donors, you know, these are, we're dealing with people's lives. There are some moral issues to consider. There are ethical issues. And as we mentioned, some collections, like the ones pertaining to the Kurdish community or the queer community, demand from us this notion of extra sensitivity. And so the negotiation happens on, on many levels and we're constantly rethinking and constantly trying to apply this notion of uh, where is our responsibility as custodians? When you look at the websites of a lot of archive uh, institutions, including ours, it's always work in progress. The whole notion of intellectual property takes on a dimension that a foundation like ours would reel from because suddenly you enter into legal details and legal issues that would stifle our mission to provide greater access. And what we did in the last month, for instance, was together with the Sursop Museum, which is a museum of contemporary art, as well as with the Orient Institute in Beirut, is to precisely engage peer organizations in Lebanon, but together with international um, uh, archives like the Asia Archive and others from Latin America, precisely to talk about these issues because nobody has answers for how much can you open up and who opens up, who has, the, who has the last word on that? And what is it that we can do to take risks in terms of promoting open knowledge, but also respecting the wishes of uh, depositors and trying to create policies and as clear as possible on the platform that give uh, uh, collection owners the right to say, I want this taken down or in this specific political time, I fear that this collection uh, should not be exposed in this way and having this flexibility to negotiate this agency. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, I'm just aware of time and I have tons of questions for both of you, um, but we would like to, to also open the floor up for your comments. Um, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to, to unmute yourself. If you would like to turn on your video, we would love to see your faces as well. Um, perhaps this is where I will stop for a moment and see if there is anyone from the audience members who would like to, to speak. 
You can also use the, the chat box if you prefer to, to type your questions for Heba and Vartan. So perhaps some of us are still formulating their thoughts or their questions. So I'll just take the, um, this opportunity to ask maybe one more question. Um, Heba, in the, the very beginning, you mentioned um, about the, the shrinking civic space and how you are thinking about the position of the Arab Image Foundation um, in this very particular fear. I also wanted to, to ask you about your allies um, within, the, within this civic space that we are talking about, because you mentioned some of the, the arts organizations that you've been um, developing workshops with, or you've been having conversations about these contracts, the ideas of custodianship, but I'm also wondering if there are other rights organizations that you are in touch with when you are presenting these um, stories, when you are creating these narratives um, and sharing with other people. But I also see that some of um, our audience members are turning their cameras on. Um, so please feel free to, to jump in as well. Thank you, Oscar. I'll just very briefly respond to that. Um, it's, it's precisely the environment in, in, in which we operate that supports our work and where in turn we can also support our peers. Um, and it's not a question of how long we've been around, but more of what have been the challenges, the good and the bad practices. How do we talk about them openly so that others learn and benefit and can challenge us in, in return? And, and so when we're faced with, for instance, in November of last year, in the middle of the reconstruction and trying to stabilize the entire office, which was damaged, we had a, a, a very interesting exchange with uh, the Basement Cultural Foundation in Yemen, a small collective that was just about launching an initiative to preserve a lot of the documents, photographs that are um, held by families. And, and it was a huge undertaking in the sense of not just imparting technical uh, uh, details about the craft, about how do you collect and how do you digitize and how do you catalog and how do you document, but really engaging them and pushing them to question why is it that they're collecting? And if they're collecting, are there different ways of doing it? Do you have to have the physical objects in your custody? Can you think of other ways of, of doing this precisely to share the agency? Um, and we find ourselves in this in, in, in these types of uh, discussions and constellations, which are extremely interesting. Recently, I was in, in Winterthur in, in Switzerland thinking, you know, the, the archive, the Photography Archive Institute knows it all. And every question I asked, and I told the team when I came back, I mean, they were very honest in saying, we don't have an answer. We also struggle with this. Uh, so, and this is very heartwarming. And to be in a, in a network, uh, and we've been in a network, in a huge network that we've co-led for many years, the Middle East Photograph Preservation Initiative, which is, which is also a way of strengthening the work we're doing because we can't do it alone and the more people out there concerned and working on preserving heritage be it image or music or anything that tells our stories is a way of pushing uh, uh, the shrinking space as we say it because it's it's encroaching on us and we feel it I mean I speak for the region but other people can can speak in terms of um, other problems in, in, in different regions yeah, we have a comment in the, the chat box. Um, Shelley and James DeVito Porter, uh, they are thanking um, the Arab Image Foundation, Heba and Vartan, um, for the integrity uh, with which you work. Uh, thank you so much for your comment. Um, okay, I could say something. Hi, Mary. Sounds gay. Hello, everybody. Um, I think that this aspect of preservation and witness going parallel together, the essentialness is so important. 
and the idea that um, we can amplify this through our work, of course, you know, being in the art field, I'm super touched by this. So I think because we have the silence, I feel like Vartan, now might be an interesting time to talk about where you are in the development of the project that we're doing in New York um, as part of a few and many places, the Proto Cinema exhibition. I know it's still in evolutionary stages and you're a lot of thinking going on, but um, can you tell us where you are with that? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you for joining the session. It's nice to see familiar faces. Uh, I would like to give context first because it's a project that we are now developing. It was an accidental find through the workshop where we were really discussing the importance of the witness as carrier of data and information mm -hmm. and the importance of oral tradition because many, many times uh, you lose access to, uh, to physical data and you would need to carry it within you. One of the works we looked at uh, was Fahrenheit, I forgot the number, 781 or something. So, which is, which is, which is the story of how when books were banned, people had to memorize them, irrespective of, of the quality of the work, but the idea of having to carry information within your body, it goes and gets, you know, engraved and coded within you so that at a later stage it can be transcribed either through audio within another body or on a document it can be a recording it can be uh, in writing it can be a photograph it can be all of that and i've been working in the last 10 years on the materiality of memory and how all data is just either a scratch or a stain on a certain medium. This includes dreams, aspirations, music, photographs, sculptures, manuscripts, books, everything. But it's also this biological aspect of it, which we know that is being amplified again through the new hard disks that are promoted to us, which are biological hard disks. That now the next hard disks are, are DNA polymers, which is very much, it takes us back to how we carry within our molecules data. So we were watching a, a film uh, and we remember the importance of certain, uh, certain stories on cuisine. And I remembered uh, that my great grandmother, Yekh Sapet, who's from Hassan Bey, from Amanos, she came to Lebanon uh, and I know through her that her and her daughters, my great aunts, who are still alive, used to come uh, around my hometown in Biblos Shvail and gather this, this weird plant. And I've always heard stories about it, that this is poisonous. And they go and prepare it in a special way and send some for my father. I never had it. I thought maybe there's an exaggeration happening, but but then I also remember that there was this other plant, which growing up, they told us this is snake poison, one, or don't go there because this is where snakes are, because snakes eat from it to do their poisons. So like, I was looking how this dish in itself had been carried by them, from Amanos through the deserts of their Zor to Lebanon, and they learned it. And like, I was wondering if anyone from my generation knows this, and I was digging and thought maybe the best way to, for preservation and archiving is for more witnesses to learn how to do it. So, so this is what we're working on. And I can tell you, we found the plant, I gathered some of it, it still grows around my hometown, and it is really poisonous. It wasn't, and it wasn't an exaggeration. It is a really poisonous uh, plant. Uh, and for some reason, they prepare it for hours and hours overnight, cook it, cook it again. So I went to my great aunt, tried to learn from her. I met someone else who knows the recipe, who I want to compare recipes now. So like to get the best form of this dish called tershik. And in the recipes I found, it's clearly not very tasty because they mention 
like a disclaimer saying, even if you don't like it, you should have it at least once because it's, it's very good for your health. And it is a story that sounds very uh, banal and quotidian, but also it has biblical scale manifestations because within their imaginary, they think it's linked to this biblical verse that talks about cooking a poisonous dish in a time of famine. And they keep, and, and they have kept this tradition. So actually my project, we will be showing another work related to gaps in photographs, but the other project is just learning how to make this dish. So we will have a picnic in New York and try to see if we can pull this. And I, I want to thank uh, Proto Cinema for pushing me to do this because like it's happening very soon, it's happening this month. <laughs> and it's in season, so we found it. Thank you, Vartan. Thank you, Mary. Uh, we all look forward to to seeing the, the projects, maybe not in person <laughs> this time, but uh, from a distance. We are very much looking forward to it. Um, I also wanted to read out loud uh, Christine's comment um, that she shared with us in the, the chat box. Um, she says that she thinks that the expansion beyond the preservation of objects and care for objects is something discussed around the world with demands of repatriation of cultural artifacts um, from primarily Western museums. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. before that, she was also writing that it seems like the, the movement towards centering people, not only objects, is central to the practice of the foundation by going back to collection donors and depositors. It's something that I also, um, I was having in my mind when we were having the, the conversation because a lot of times, um, I would say that um, the discussions around the publicness sometimes is reduced to this experience of gathering. We have an exhibition, we gather. We have a conversation, we gather. Um, I have a mentor who actually causes the powerless socialization. Um, and I think when it comes to what, Arapimich, what the Arab Image Foundation is proposing, and it's also a generation of institutions who've been thinking about publics in a different way, even the terminology changes, you know, the, the way that we use the, the term user or constituent rather than um, these more spectator-like terms for the, the people who would come and join these conversations. Um, I think it's part of a larger discussion as um, Christine is pointing it out. Um, and it's also moving away from the, the expert culture and the traditional understanding of ownership that Heba was speaking about as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if we have um, one more question from us because um, I think we will have to, to wrap up quite soon. Um, but if there are any comments um, or anything that you would like to, to share, we can take advantage of the fact that it's a Zoom meeting um, and we can all speak to each other and it would be great to your, see your faces again. Um, or Heba and Vartan, would you have any last words? Maybe um, we can go back to you. Um, how we can further participate in your projects or if there are, if there are any questions from your side, mm -hmm. we would love to hear them as well. I mean, um... I don't want to sound promotional by saying this, but the newsletter that we put out every month is for us the, the medium, the format, the content that we, we hope we get feedback on, that people can push us to think in alternative ways and precisely to stay focused and, and be people-centered in everything that we do, because at the end of the day, that's the mission that we have, as Christine said, it's not, it's not only the object, it's what the object represents. And behind every photographic object is a human story. How can we stay true to this type of um, one decentralized, but also participatory, and as much as possible trying to ward off um, constrictive spaces? both in our practices, but also in, in how people use, uh, sometimes abuse 
content that is out there, just the, all of these challenges. So push us and if you have ideas, engage with us. The second thing I would love that you, for those who speak Arabic, um, we put out the first podcast last month. The second one is coming out this month. It's a three minute. Listen to it, give us your feedback. We're trying to revive and tell a different type of story through audio about our collections. Um, there are 300 of them, so we have time. Uh, and we'd like to take you with us on, on this journey. And again, the platform with all its inconsistencies is a wonderful place if you want to explore, um, ask us questions, but give us some time to respond because we're a small team. Um, and just spread the word um, with students and artists and researchers who, who want to come and dig and, and look at the collections that we have. Thank you, Eske. Well, maybe, I'd, may I? Please, of course. So maybe I'd like, a, a, maybe it's too pedantic, but like a follow-up question to that is, what are, for both Vartan and Heba, what are the ways of amplifying that we can also like expand on and support you in, in addition to like giving, you know, get, have, encouraging people to go and research there and include it in their, you know, discord. What are the other ways of um, generating more witnesses? I can give an example that is also part of the exhibition. So within the exhibition, we are primarily showing the findings from a workshop, a workshop that we started at the Kevorkian Center, but of course we, we negotiated for it to be open for everyone. So it's not only NYU students, and it wasn't only people who paid for the course. It was anyone that was interested mm -hmm. and, and committed to the entire class. So one of the findings and moments of, of contemplation uh, within the workshop will, will, will be part of the exhibition and open to others. So we are we are taking a couple of our contracts at the Arab Inc. Foundation. So like we are opening also, a part of our archives is our contracts. Mm -hmm. We will have them as open Google documents on which we invite people to add their comments to mm -hmm. help us think together of what a contract should look like. Of course, uh, Christine has been working a lot on, on, on the legal aspect with lawyers, with, with thinkers, uh, but we also need to help them to think outside of their own practice. So eventually, of course, it will go to uh, a, a, bigger, a bigger community. So again, it, it is almost like the question you asked before. There is the place where we can imagine solutions and then we can work with how to make these solutions uh, applicable as well. But I think we can send invitations for people to join this ongoing contract research that will go on for the entire time of the exhibition where we fight we have conflicts there we try to say how we imagine things should be uh, and these are also documents to keep and refer to thank you Can I maybe add one thing if you don't mind I mean, I think this is just, I'm like kind of referring, just riffing off what Vartan said, but in, um, thinking about contracts and just to throw out, you know, we always like go back to law as if, you know, because law is ultimately what will, what governs, um, you know, the way we operate and um, it is super problematic to do that, but it, that is the reality, right? And so I think that what we're also proposing through this is to think beyond um, you know, ex to think extra jur jurisdictionally of what is possible. So how do we think about codes of conduct? How do we think about codes of ethics um, engaging? How do, we, um, how do we have people think beyond just sort of like technically what they're allowed to do, but actually instill a sense of thinking about um, a different kind of practice of ethics? And so I think that's something that we've been trying to do Within the workshop, within the foundation, I think that's something that has to be cultivated, um, and it takes definitely community, you know, work um, to think through what that looks like, and to, um, uh, yeah, just to 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 have that be a culture, right? To 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 not have an extractive culture um, of using images, of using objects, of using um, wanting to possess things, but rather thinking about the ethics of it. And so, 
um, I think that there, there are so many limits to the legal and, and it demands um, creativity from outside of, um, outside of that sort of practice. So just throwing that out there. So inviting people to sort of think about these questions as well, something that um, I think we'd like to do. Thank you. Christine. I can add one thing because, because someone has to say it. Part of what we really worked hard to do is to hire Hiba. Uh, and this is how we really want to work. She can tell you more. It was a process of six, seven, eight months of just meeting and chatting. And we are not, I mean, I want to force you to say mm -hmm. she joined because we see the foundation moving into even physically, yeah, digitally and physically being more inclusive, more open, moving into a part of the city or part of different cities around the world where people can come and work really. So you should tell us a little bit about our, yeah, yeah the projects we entrusted you with. <laughs> Yes, that was the, the, the longest and most joyful courtship I've had professionally. <laughs> Thank you, Varda, for the trust. And I'm lucky to be part of a, of a group where we see eye to eye because it's not every day that one ends up in an institution where, you know, if when people ask me, so what's the board like? And I say, it's great, we have engaging discussions, it's not this top-down and people who are from outer space. Uh, the team is fantastic, so I'm, I'm lucky. And, and the foundation and its history, despite all the challenges that it's, it's been through, speaks volumes to the fact that we, we have it easy. We have, a, we have a niche, we have a great resource, and it's up to this group of people to do something with it and hopefully whatever it is that we carry forward in terms of programming in terms of finding the right place to expand in because we have dreams we want to really make sure that we can process our three biggest pending collections um, and to make sure that we can have a space that can accommodate physically people who can come and do fellowships and residencies and work on these collections because this is what preservation is all about in the end. Uh, and the very many stories that these things carry. Um, and to have, I mean, I must say also what, what um, in the nonprofit world, we're often complaining a lot that there's no money and there are no resources, and it's true. But I think what I saw in the last nine months and following the explosion is the incredible amount of solidarity from people near and far, individuals and donors, and the generosity, the flexibility of many people who understand what our mission is about is very heartwarming. And I think this is the way to try and, and, and not see ourselves as separate entities from the others, from users, from donors, but really to try and, and create networks of support, whether people are donating or people are activating collections or pushing us to think uh, about ethical issues and not only the legal uh, details. This is all what will make us uh, hopefully achieve our priorities over the next five years and hopefully in five years we can come back and tell you more stories um, and not just more disasters like the last one. <laughs> I think a great point to, to wrap up um, and Vartan also included a very important footnote um, that place should ideally be um, a place with an open library that serves cake, which we'll all take into consideration for our <laughs> future uh, dream projects as well. Um, Heba and Vartan, I really want to thank you for your inspiring work and also for sharing um, the recent discussions that you are having with the team. Um, Christine, thanks so much for joining us too. Um, I also have, before we close, I also have an um, important um, announcement to make. Um, Ipek, uh, who is a member Orta Format. Uh, yesterday was her birthday, so we'd like to take this opportunity <laughs> to say <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> Okay, I Happy birthday, Ipek. Happy birthday, Ipek. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Özge and everyone. This is how we wanted to end. So that was a collective decision. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining us, for sharing your thoughts and questions. And uh, we really hope that the, the conversation is going to be continued very soon. Uh, Vartan Hebla, thank you once again uh, for making us part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, Özge and Epek. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs> bye bye.